Dry, barren dirt roads, the ancient compass of where my people walked. Barefoot, I'm told, wore their loincloths with pride, told stories of old and anywhere they would ride. They danced all night, they talked all night, they sang all night, ancient as the celestial sky, guided by the moon, none of the western gloom, not a word such as soon, only nature's bloom. No borders, they roamed free, no orders, only our free will. The dung beetle is the doctor of the road, they say. My people were never lost, heathens they were not, they chose help at their side, natives with pride, they made good of the soil, the land still ours, we were happy to toil, time was never too soon, guided by the moon, you know western gloom, only nature's bloom. Absolutely phenomenal. You are great. We can't wait to be hearing you throughout the session. So please make sure you stay tuned as she'll be performing after every single speaker. If you want to find out more about who she is and the things that she's done, uh, you can head on over to our chat section over there. Nati has given us a nice little brief bio about who she is and the things that she has done. So we're going to be hearing more of her throughout the session. So let's get into today's session. It's titled Reimagining New Narratives. And it is a storytelling session. I'm very excited because some of our speakers are going to be reciting some of these stories. And I hear that we might actually have an exclusive here. So very exciting news. And it really is about how we can trans transform ourselves as well as our society through our narratives. And without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today. His name is Muti, and he has combined expertise and experience in social history and data science, technology, and cultural heritage. He designs and delivers projects and tells stories that challenge the status quo in Malawi to bring lasting change. And although he is Malawian, he does say that he is indeed in Switzerland and he's going to bring us some chocolate. <laughs> so I hope he keeps his promise. So Muti, you can take over. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, it's good to be here, and thanks for tuning in, everyone. Um, I, I, would, I would like to, before I get into it, um, can I get my, my slides up, please? Um, uh, 
No, I, I can't see my slide. All right, so I think Kuma is working on getting the slides up. Oh, yeah. Sure. That's fine, that's fine. Um, All right, fantastic. So you can do a quick little uh, bio of who you are, where you are, and why you're in Switzerland in the meantime, while we're waiting for your slides. Sure, sure. So um, I'm actually, I'm in Switzerland. Uh, I've been here since June, uh, going back home next week, Friday. Uh, we came here to give birth. My, my wife is Swiss British. Um, so we, uh, we've, uh, yeah, we do come here quite, um, quite a few times, uh, but I'm based in Malawi. Uh, born and raised in Blanta, Malawi, uh, but currently living in Lilongwe, the capital of Malawi. Um, uh, brief bio about me, uh, storyteller, filmmaker, uh, trained in Cape Town, uh, Big Fish in Cape Town, shout out to Big Fish, uh, author uh, since 2000. Uh, just to a storyteller, I think story storyteller captures, captures it quite quite nicely. Yeah. Um, as it says, I'm passionate about uh, engaging with uh, platforms that we use to share uh, knowledge. Um, and these platforms are, are always are, are very, uh, they're, they're always dynamic. Uh, we don't always try to keep up, but um, I, I try, I try to keep up. And that explains maybe the data science Part of my of my of my uh, of my storytelling. Um, I am. Um, I think your slides are up, so you can get into your presentation, and then straight after that, then you can sure, get sure, 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 sure. some of your new content. Sure, sure. Uh, so my some of my highlights uh, include uh, presenting in twenty fourteen at TEDx in Longwe, uh, agitating for for the use of Wikipedia to try and balance uh, representation across the world uh, and also just engaging uh, with uh, this notion called Wiki Africa. Uh, these are editors across Africa trying to improve content on Wikipedia. Uh, you know, despite the challenges around that, uh, Wikipedia being, I think, the most used platform um, for people to, people to, access, to access knowledge. Uh, so Wiki Africa exists uh, really to try and balance the challenges that People from the north, uh, and I'm being simplistic here. People from, say, continental Europe or the USA or Canada are the ones who are mostly writing about Africa. Uh, so, Wiki Africa tries to try, you know, try to we try to balance that by really reaching out to Africans to try and own our own narrative, to try and own, um, you know, our own stories uh, despite the challenges. Uh, another highlight is uh, I think being guest faculty for uh, Soyons College, uh, which is a top uh, liberal college in the US. Um, I designed and taught a course called, uh, called Understanding Human Development in Cultural, Cultural and Historical Context, really zooming into Malawi, uh, uh, bringing the history and, um, um, and the current affairs and trying to move a trajectory out of, out of that. Um, another highlight of, highlight of mine is winning an award, uh, the Peer Gained Literary Award in 2005, uh, as is uh, being uh, the Gate Institute's Moving Africa Scholar in 2011. Um, I've, been, uh, I've, been, I've been telling stories, um, it's quite a bit now. I, I've got a few books published, uh, some are available on Amazon. If you, if you search my name on Amazon, uh, you might find some, some titles there. Um, telling stories mostly because I love telling stories, but also seeing the need uh, for us to tell our own stories. Uh, um, I can have the next slide, please. Next slide. So my my approach towards storytelling. Um, I run, I run an, an entity called Logos Open Culture, um, which is at the intersection of com, um, computation, com, or computation or computing uh, plus arts culture heritage. It's trying to find a space where these two, uh, where these two strands meet and can propel, them, uh, uh, can propel forward uh, together. Um, there's a bunch of us in Logos Open Culture, there's me, there's Rachel, uh, with a background in English literature and anthropology. There's Mona with a background in anthropology. And then there's John Wanda 
John Wonder is possibly Malawi's most prolific social scientist, uh, and to have him on our team is uh, is just a blessing. Uh, it really the idea behind local open culture is to again really try uh, as much as possible to tell to tell our own stories as uh, Malawians uh, in particular, but also as as um, um, as Africans in general. And really dig, going into the archives to really try and dig what stories reside in there and try to bring them up um, on, um, uh, onto, the, uh, you know, onto the mainstream. So one of our approaches is using uh, what we call traditional storytelling. Uh, what you see in front of you are two book titles that we've published so far. Uh, they are available across the world, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, you can find them. Um, and really, again, um, I think, it, let me just zoom in into the first, uh, the first title, which is Lomatinda, Rose Chiwambo Speaks. I think you can, only, you can only see the Lomatinda part, but the, uh, Rose Chiwambo is someone who's very, very important uh, to the history of Malawi, but also to the history of uh, women empowerment across the continent. Uh, she fought for independence in Malawi uh, when Malawi was under uh, British, British rule. She was mostly maybe the only woman uh, in there uh, fighting for this. Uh. In fact, she was, she was, she was put in jail uh, two days after giving birth. Um, so you can imagine being thrown in jail for over a year, you know, two days after giving birth. Um, and then when it came to Malawi, uh, she found herself in a prominent position um, in cabinet uh, before she fell out of favor with the, with the then president of Malawi. Kamuzubanda, and then she had to flee Malawi, uh, and she was outside of Malawi for 30 years until 1994, when uh, democracy sort of returned uh, to Malawi. Uh, so someone like her, just her story wasn't, you know, it wasn't in the, uh, it wasn't in the public domain. Um, she was put on the money uh, towards the end of her, uh, I think this is, uh, this is around 20, I think 20, 2010, 2011, she was put on one of the banknotes in Malawi. Um, and most youngsters associated her as that pretty face on the money. Uh, and that was it, those, those aren't really much to her story. It's simply because the, uh, the youngsters didn't really know her story. Um, the reason being that stories like hers, a lot of stories in Malawi are just not in the public domain. So one of the things that we try to do as local urban culture is to really bring these uh, stories into uh, into the public domain by going into the archives um, and you know publishing these books and using 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 very good standards uh, because we want to not only do we want to tell our stories but we want to tell them uh, using quality that can actually uh, stand the world market. Um, so it's quite a lot, quite 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 a lot uh, goes into our goes, uh, goes into our production uh, around research. The second title you see is called Malawi Place Apart. Um, it's a very good book on Malawi. Uh, if you're looking, if you if, if you want to read about Malawi, uh, it, that's a nice introduction. It gives one a very, a very good overview uh, of how far the country has come uh, and some of the challenges, some of the successes, and some of the challenges. Uh, it's written by a foreigner. He was the Norwegian ambassador to Malawi for almost 10 years. But he's a very keen observer and he's, uh, he's quite, um, he's quite, um, it's very much, he's, he's very understanding of our situation in Malawi uh, when it comes to uh, some of the challenges. Uh, you know, when you look at the numbers across the world, Malawi being in the, I don't know, top five of four countries, you know, like I, I, I'm around that narrative uh, is, is very understanding, trying to bring all those factors um, into play. So I, I highly recommend, if you want to read about Malawi, uh, this is a book uh, to latch onto, um, but also obviously you give us a bit of money as well, which is, which is, which is always welcome. Um, our next title, which comes out, uh, it comes out on Easter. Um, it was supposed to come out this December, but the author is actually in Scotland. Uh, he's Malayan, but he's in Scotland and he cannot fly until this whole COVID business has settled down. But the, the book is looking at the history of music in Malawi, uh, really trying to map the whole trajectory of music in Malawi, starting from the pre-colonial times uh, to when the impact with Britain happened, uh, bringing into 
bringing Malawi into the colonial period and then beyond that, and how music has played a crucial role um, in, in the building of the social fabric that is modern day Malawi. So we are quite excited about that. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that book um, soon because it kind of ties in into what I'm, uh, into the narrative that I'm, uh, when, when I try to imagine newer narratives, uh, you know, what does that mean to me? Uh, can I get the next slide, please? And then the, um, this is called the Malawi, Malawi, Malawian Histories and the Medical Humanities. Uh, it's a digital repository, which we did. Uh, this is now still local open culture, which we did with uh, Dr. Kalinga, who's faculty at the University of Edinburgh uh, and uh, in association with the University of Edinburgh. And again, really just exploring newer forms of publishing, uh, really understanding that traditional publishing as we know it, it just can't, it just can't cut it anymore. Uh, we need to find newer forms of, you know, of, uh, of preserving our, our stories, our memory, but also, you know, uh, uh, so broadcasting our, our memory. Uh, and again, we, this is where now the, uh, the computation part of local open culture, this is where now it comes in, where we're trying to use uh, computing and bringing in arts, culture and heritage and to see how uh, this, you know, these, these strands can propel themselves uh, forward. Uh, if you get a moment, uh, just Google this uh, repository. It's, it's quite rich. Uh, it's got a lot of uh, content there. And we are very, we're, we're, we're keen on, we're, we're keen on capturing metadata. Uh, we haven't done that well um, you know, in Malawi and across Africa when it comes to really, uh, you know, taking care of our, what, you know, what, what people call the, the commons. So these will be images or films um, or, a, or electronic records. Uh, around the metadata, we haven't done a good job. Uh, so the other thing that we're doing as local sovereign culture, uh, and also for me personally as, as a storyteller is to really put so much emphasis uh, on capturing metadata and really trying to contextualize uh, whatever it is that we are, uh, we are, uh, we are, we are, we are pushing into the, into the public domain. Um, can I get the next slide, please? Now, um, the brief that I was given uh, for this talk, which is to reimagine newer narratives. Um, I've just emphasized four strands, uh, which kind of feeds into what I, what I believe uh, is, it should be our focus as storytellers um, of, you know, uh, who are either African or of, um, holding towards Africa or who identify as, as African authors. Uh, one of the, the first one is really, you know, really trying to challenge the Eurocentric frame of reference um, and really contextualizing that in the post-colonial um, narrative. Because one of the, I like to use this example uh, for Malawi, for example, which is when David Livingstone, uh, the famous Scottish explorer, uh, you know, came to Malawi. And he discovered he discovered quote unquote uh, Lake Malawi and gave it a name uh, Lake Nyasa in, the, in those days. Um, and then this lake now assumes a newer you know a, you know a new name under you know Lake Nyasa. And then just as a result, you, you get to a point where Livingstone as a you know as an explorer sort of you know. Uh, he challenges um, he, his, his gaze overtakes uh, the gaze of the locals um, in this very act of naming. Um, and then with the passage of time, uh, and thanks again you know, to this Eurocentric frame of reference where, where you know, things, things like Lake Malawi, you know, they get to be defined from a gaze uh, which is which is which is which is pro uh, problematic uh, and so for me as a storyteller being in a space to say that no David Livingstone didn't have the right uh, you know to name name things um, and again using that given that that the people who were there so this would be my ancestors ancestors they were the first ones who were to deem this reality and give it a name uh, so for to, to have a gaze come on top of that and you know, sort of uh, supersede 
uh, that um, you know uh, the edges that, that my ancestors had, I think storytelling can be used as a tool to try and you know reclaim uh, some of those uh, some of those historical um, some of those historical mistakes. Um, and storytelling being you know being a very powerful tool as well uh, in terms of around you know passing on memory and and all of that. Uh, and also, I like to I like to remember you know, the words of uh, Haile Gerima. Those of you who follow film in Africa, um, Haile Gerima is uh, one of Africa's most brilliant filmmakers. Um, if you can find Teza, uh, one of his films, if you can search online for Teza, uh, and then uh, Haile Gerima says one needs to be selfish of one's own story. And uh, for us as storytellers, as Africans. Storytellers, we really need to, you know, we really need to own our own story and be selfish enough to really, you know, to, uh, you know, to do what it takes uh, to have our story in the in the public domain um, as a way of writing some of the wrongs that have happened, but also just as a way of, you know, uh, of being. Um, and again, as, like, like I said earlier, the second point really emphasizing on creating metadata uh, and just the means of storing these digital assets, because this is so important. In 2016, I did a project uh, under Wiki Africa, I went in, into the National Archives of Malawi. We digitized a lot of content, some images, uh, but there are no captions. Uh, and you can imagine the headache uh, of that. Uh, and then the question becomes, how do we get to this point where we've got all these images uh, spanning 60 years, for example, and we just don't have captions uh, for them. Uh, we're, just not, we're just not doing our job. Properly, so we uh, we uh, I, for me as a storyteller, we really need to be keenly focusing on really you know adding the metadata, you know the data that defines whatever subject we're dealing with, uh, so that if someone comes twenty years from today, um, they'll be able to contextualize uh, you know those those assets. Um, another point again is uh, really putting focus on creating local local ecosystems, thriving ecosystems. Um, and again, using Malawi as a case in point, we as storytellers, the structures are just not in place. Um, so you find that uh, whatever industries we've got, whatever um, it's whatever means we're, you know, we're trying to use to reach the world, uh, we're, not, we're, we're not really being, we can do more if we can actually have, we can, we can create, define, uh, you know, being a space where we are we, we're able to create uh, local existence where different sets of, um, of skills are coming together to produce uh, quality, uh, quality products uh, that the world can actually consume. Um, so yeah, I would, I would also really, really emphasize on um, um, on that point. Then my last point is just really just showing up on the global stage uh, and really just being confident enough in our own stories to, you know, to say that we we are we've got our own stories. We we'll, you know we show up on the global stage and and um, and we will tell um, we will tell our, our, our own stories. Uh, so, you know, regardless of um, um, of um, um, Regardless of the forces that are uh, acting acting against against us, um, so uh, I think that's about I think that's about it uh, uh, for my part. Uh, All right, fantastic, Muti. I think in the interest of time, can you hold on to some of your uh, your new storytelling, your new content that you're going to be releasing? We'll probably get into that in the Q&A section. So get ready for that one. But thank you so much. That was so interesting. Um, and please feel free to ask me to some questions in the chat section. We'll be doing a Q&A after all the speakers have gone through. But in the meantime, let's let's enjoy some sounds from Gilani Bubu with the second revision of her song while our next speaker, Kumba, gets ready. So let's enjoy.
Pilani Boo Boo, it's your turn now. We're waiting for the beautiful voice of yours. Beetle. Now this next traditional folk song is about a crab. Now the story about the crab is really funny because crabs, you know, the mother crab tells the child crab to walk straight, but she herself can't exactly walk straight. So it's a little bit hypocritical. But essentially, I've interpreted the song to say that, you know, sometimes you don't have to walk straight to go forward. It's called Wa Didi Alunungana. to be chatting to Kumba, who is an educator, facilitator, writer, trainer, manager, and coach, a feminist with more than 20 years of experience working for social change in Francophone West Africa. Bonjour, Kumba. Bonjour. <laughs> See, I'm trying some Good French. <laughs> Ça va bien et toi? <laughs> Merci, ça va très bien. <laughs> Jesse, I've tried, I'm trying, I'm trying really hard. Lovely to have you here. Uh, you may go on with your presentation and then we'll have our Q&A session afterwards. Good morning, in Sorry? Yeah, thanks. Maria Jara Dendo Kumbate Sirankun 
Ko joni ni joni dendo. Se na bunja idendo. Kumba te sirunko. Whose and whose child is it? I said, I am Bakaja Tambura's child. I am Maria Jara child. I am Sina Bunjai child. Kojonini Johnny Dendo. Fire to redendo kumba tesirunkoni. Whose child is it? I am fire Ture's child, and this is why I'm not afraid. See, to those willing to carry the clay pot. Kolmu, I will give the power of balance, a sense of justice, said Mangalaba, the deity of deities at the beginning of creation. To those willing, to carry the clay pot, I will give the power of balance, the sense of justice. They will come back again and again to give birth to new world, to new lives, said Mangalaba. See? I'm not going to tell the whole story. You'll have to read the book. <laughs> Muso is a story of creation, uh, a feminist story of creation I wrote. In the beginning, song is just my own introduction. And I'm introducing myself to all of you greeting you from wherever you are. And I identify myself in naming my mothers. My mother who gave birth to me, but all the other mothers who raised me two times from different countries, from different walks of life, and different mothers that taught me different things and made me who I am today. So if I need to make my bio or say who I am, I would name them. And if I told their stories, each of my mothers, then you would understand who I am and why I do what I do. But we won't dwell in that today. I want to share pieces, just small pieces of stories, but also how they come about and how they are connected to the conversation we're having today on new narrative. So Muso, um, the Feminist Story of Creation is actually a children, it's a book for children, you can find it uh, on, on Amazon, published by Dara Ja Press, it's in English, is a myth, like most of the myth of creation. And uh, it's one that I created, it's not a story I heard. You know, I remember places where I spoke it and people are like, whoa, where is that story from? Which ancient, you know, tradition did it come from? Like this today tradition, I'm making tradition right now. I'm creating a myth so that in the generation to come, it will become a tradition. So, because we know no tradition fell from the sky. 
because we know there is a beginning for everything. So as a feminist tired of, I guess, creation stories that basically do not give a nice role to women, I decided to make one so that our children can grow also with those type of stories. Um, bam, bam, yini. Um, bam, bam, yini. Fala, den, den. Fala, ba, den, den. We are looking for our mothers. We are looking for our mothers. This is a story of twin girls in search of their mothers. They were adopted by a beautiful woman, very dark, very black woman who traded beautiful cloth across the Sahel and who told them at the age of 13 that she was not their birth mother. So the twin girls set on a journey to look for their birth mother. And this was their song that they went from village to village singing. And they had in their bag a piece of cloth, but only half of it, indigo cloth, that they were wrapped into when they were born. See, I will not tell the rest of that story. I, the story of Badi and Sandy, twin girls, are another story that I wrote for children. It's a published book in French, also in English now. Um, but that story is a traditional story of the Sahel. It's a story that you hear in the different version, a quest for um, the birth mother, the natural parents. But the story says in the end that you have multiple mothers, which is the theme of what I've been saying about, which is the truth also that those who raise you are as much your parents as those who gave birth to you. That we understand the motherhood and expand it beyond the physical giving birth. That story in the way it's written is a very different um, origin or way of writing than Musso, the one that I just referred to before, because that one is a story that is known. Now, what is different in the way that I write it? See, in one of my languages, I guess my mother tongue, my first language, my mother's language, Bamana, which is the language of the people of Mali, but it's a language that is spoken in many places across West Africa, in Ivory Coast, in Burkina Faso, in Guinea. Uh, it's Which part of the family of the Mandingo language. Um, you can tell a story without telling the gender of the, the, the main character. I can tell the twin story of these twins looking for their mothers from beginning to end, make the song, say everything. And in the end of the story, people who listen to it will make what they want of the character. They can decide if the character is female or male or if it's both or you know, whatever. But when you translate that story in French or English, it's impossible to write the story without be, without it being gendered. And I realized that in many of the traditional stories, when we read it, when it's written, and we read it from the books and the language of our colonizers, um,
sorry, I lost you for a minute. But um, when, you, when, you, when you use the language of the colonizers, you have to put a gender. And I realized that most of the time, people who transcribe or wrote those stories generally were men. So they always change. Um, they always change the stories and put them in, uh, uh, put the characters, the characters becomes all of a sudden all male. So, Um, so, um, just saying that that process, what I, what I did with the twin story was to go against basically how it was always written in this area, because the twins are always boy. I made them girl. I changed the characters. And again, of course, you will see the feminist part of this, of this, um, you know, choice. I'll end with a third example um, in this story. This is a story that is 4,000 years old, okay? 4,000 years old. A story of a peasant that is going from his village and going to the city of Kemet in Egypt. And on the way, the, a representative of the government, somebody that would be a police man today, stops him because the peasant has a lot of nice goods and he's going to sell them to buy a few other things. And the police wants the goods of the peasant. So he tricks him and force him to take and start taking his goods. I won't tell the whole story, but just something to so that you can you can go in and get the books. <laughs> I didn't write this story. It's a story written by scribes in Egypt. Uh, it's written in hieroglyphs. But I'm lucky to be with people where I live who reads the hieroglyph and decide to translate this story in eleven languages, including Hausa, Bambara, Portuguese. And you can read the story. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about story in the, in, the, in the discussion because I feel like this is where I'm going. Uh, this is the source I'm going towards, getting into the older stories and learning about how not only injustice is old, but the resistance is old also. It says the story about using poetry and art 4,000 years ago to seek justice. Uh, and, and I think it is in the tradition that we are continuing today. I see your face and understand that my time is up. <laughs> you know me <laughs> too well, Kumba, you know me too well. <laughs> I just, wanted to, I just got so, goosebumps with your presentation. I'll, 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 I'll stop here and I'll, and I'll come back um, in, the, in the questions time and with all the examples. But I'm just happy to be here and I thank everyone who, uh, who is taking the time to hear us today. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Kumba. Um, while Pilani Bubu gets ready, I've got a question for you, Kumba. Um, you were mentioning quite a lot of, you know, the work that you were doing, and you kept saying, I won't give you everything. You must buy the book. Can you give us some of the names of the book while Pilani gets ready? Yes. Um, Muso, a story of creation. I'll type it in. The story of creation. If you type my name, Kumba Ture, on Amazon, it's the only book you'll find of me. It's a children's mm -hmm. book. You can find it. The story of creation by Kumba Ture, Muso, M U U M O. Muso means women. You can go and I'll type that also on um, bbquan, um, bbquan.com. It's a store. 
So uh, you will find Per Ankh books. And that's the book I'm referring to about the 4,000 years old story written and translated in Akan Bambara English, Kikongo, Kiswahili, Lingala, Portuguese, Pula, Wolof, and Zulu. It's in the same book. It's a short text, but each page is one line in all of those languages. Um, but there are many, many other books um, like this, but also books by Aikwe Arma. Those of you who know him, 2000 Seasons, The Beautiful ones are not yet born, mm. Kemet, Osiris rising, you name it. Uh, he's an amazing and prolific writer. You'll find Teofil Obenga, African philosophy on that, on that uh, store. Uh, it's Per Ankh books. Fantastic. Per Thanks Ankh for sharing. Books. Thank yes. you so much for sharing. That was phenomenal. All right, so do you believe that Filani Bubu is on standby? So let's enjoy some music while our last but not least final speaker, Ernie Bani, gets ready. Thank you, Noni. The first two tracks were about animals, traditional folk songs about animals, poetically interpreted. But this next song is about um, how the boys go to the mountain for their right of passage to manhood. In my culture, that's something we still do. I wanted to express the vulnerability and the anxiety that we sisters and mothers feel when this happens. Just to tell a different side of the story. Um, because we don't often tell that side. Though this song is about boys fighting with sticks, what else happens while we wait, right? Here's my interpretation. He took his rite of passage up the hills, down the valley to become a man. Four weeks, a mountain of anxiety, a mother's sleepless nights, on the inside strong, on the outside vulnerable. Is this what it takes to become a man? Slash skins, fallen foreskins, rat wounds at the tip of his manhood. A boy no more. A Morning finally broke, mothers awoke to a sea of blankets and sticks, naked, the faces of men painted white. A warrior's mask, what became of him? What will he be? What will he see?
award-winning behind your name for nothing you are phenomenal i just felt my spirit transcending i don't know where to but somewhere that was fantastic all right so next up we have our next speaker his name is anurban he's a filmmaker still photographer and media educator based in delhi india he started his career in television in 1996 and set up the film company metamorphosis in 2003 he's directed and produced several documentary films and created many photographic essays on diverse topics such as children's rights biodiversity, environmental issues, health, gender, sexuality, and the list goes on. All the way from India. Hello, everybody. Oh, you just muted me. Can you hear me now? There we go. Fantastic. How are you? All the way from India. Yeah, thank you so much and thank you so much for inviting me and I feel very privileged to be able to speak here and it was my dream to communicate uh, with all of you. So thank you very much and uh, a big thank you to Muchi and Kumba and I think, uh, you know, they kind of set the platform for me uh, to take the conversation forward. Uh, so um, my work started, uh, I started working about two decades ago and I felt uh, as a creative person that my storytelling skills were getting curtailed by working in a corporate setup where I was going to tell the stories that I was told to tell. Uh, so in 2003, I kind of liberated myself and I decided uh, that I'm going to go to places in India and in South Asia where people at that time were not going because they were so-called quote-unquote media dark areas and we didn't get stories from there. There were multiple reasons for this. One was that many of these places had a long history of armed conflict and people and storytellers, filmmakers did not feel safe going there. Uh, there were other issues like remote places in Eastern Himalayas, uh, you know, many other, there were uh, civil, uh, you know, there were law and order issues in many parts. Uh, so my first destination was to go to the northeastern parts of India, uh, which was the remote uh, foothills uh, in the northeastern part of the Indo-Myanmar border uh, in a place called Manipur and Nagaland. Uh, where I went, and initially, uh, though we were so-called from the same country, I was addressed as an Indian, and I was told that you are an outsider. Why have, why have you come here? And there was a historical reason for it, because the people there did not feel part of the Indian mainstream. Uh, at that time, I felt that I had to stay there for long periods of time for me to understand people as well as for them to understand me and my uh, idea as an outsider to jump in with the camera or with the equipment to tell a story just did not think right and that was my first learning that I have to embed myself in the community that I am going to tell the story from so that I am accepted and I understand the nuances of the community. So for about, it is 15 years now that I keep going back there. It is only after 11 years of going there, I felt that I could tell a story from there. Uh, and for that 11 years that I kept on going back there, I worked with young people. I worked with young adults. I worked with women and I, gave them a little 
learning that I had was to how to use a camera. But from them, I heard a lot of stories. I heard their songs, I heard their music. And I think I learned more from them than what I could give back to them. And from there started my long you know, association where uh, the young people from the community started making short videos. The young people, the women from the community started making small photo essays. And then we would take these stories and videos and we would go from one village to another in a vehicle with a small TV in those days and a DVD player. And we would have more than one DVD player because of the jerk in the car, in the vehicle, because there was almost, uh, that was almost non-motorable. The DVD players would break down and we would have a small Jenny and many a times we would have a screening at night in a church or in a small community place where there will be 200 people, 300 people who would come to see these videos and there would be a conversation after that. And one little film will start a sequence of storytelling. There will be more and more, more and more stories that will be shared. And that was my first understanding that how, though I theoretically understood that stories are a part of our life, but for the first time I understood how one story leads to another, to another, to another, and a lot of this is part of our oral tradition. And that is why uh, our common heritage, whether it's an Asian heritage or an African heritage, we have so rich tradition, such rich tradition of oral history and oral narratives. And a lot of our stories are told through songs. There is not one version of one story. There are multiple versions of the same story told from various points of view. I started understanding this. And I will, uh, I'm going to share one clip from one of the, uh, you know, films that I was made to make, I was asked to make by a woman from the community. She came and told me that she, her husband was HIV positive and she had passed away and he had passed away and she was not getting her property rights. And she told me that could I help her make a film and through that, can she start a conversation with many other women in the state who, were, who had the same fate, who were having similar experience? And who, and she wanted to put herself and her story in the camera. And I went and lived in her village to record this story. And I would like, uh, I would like, uh, you know, Noni, if you can ask Kumu to share the clip. And the clip will be from 1.30 to 4.30, please. If you could share the clip. That's all right, we can start from here. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, okay, start from here. That's all right. 
मोर नाम नवनीता शैकिया घर गोलाघाट कमरगाँव डिस्ट्रिक्ट गोलाघाट पड़े मोर विजार एक मानुज ढुका से दुहेजार चार मानुजी सदा मानुजने मोर ड्राइंग कर निजर मानुजने नकले मोर जी एन पजिटिव आर आए गम पाइस मैं तक एन पजिटिव आने निजर ब्लाड तो टेस्ट कर लो टेस्ट कर गम पाइस मैं हिसाब पजिटिव पजिटिव लखीमपुर हस्पिटल गम पासे सके तेजा परीक्षा करम नोपे मार पास क्या ना मैं घर ले अहाल नक मोर क Storytellers, 
and that is my passion actually to make more and more storytellers in the world and the more storytellers we have the more uh, the colonizers gaze that uh, you know that muchi was talking about or kumba was talking about we have to own our own stories we have to own our own narratives and that is the only way to challenge the gaze or to challenge the representation that we have gone through and there is no other way to do it and um, and and when i uh, when i say this you know i had uh, i had a wonderful uh, exchange and wonderful experience of sharing uh, you know time with uh, professor ola bibi ui the benin scholar and he once he also told me about the yoruba culture and the yoruba storytelling tradition the elders and i also felt that you know so many of our storytellers from africa are are very old you know we need to record these stories we need to archive these stories we need to preserve these stories because with this we will lose our wisdom we will lose our uh, you know the uh, you know it is just not story there is so much of knowledge that is embedded in that story so i think uh, you know that is where i am that is what i am interested in right now and along with this i also work on music so presently i am also developing a archive in india because as we have become a so called you know from developing we are becoming a big economy uh, you know lot of stuff is getting lost in this whole craziness of modernization and lot of the old things are being chucked away so lot of music has also got lost so i am also putting together with my friend anupama shrinivasan she is online right now we are trying to collect songs we are trying to create an archive of music uh, that will be there for people to study and research uh later uh, and i think that is something that is also i feel very very passionate about uh, passionately about even african music an african storytelling tradition so uh, you know that is my that is what my journey has been uh the films that i was talking about you know those films that the community members made we took them to about more than 350 villages and every 2 3 days we had screenings at night and the communities had conversations around and they were not we were not only hearing a lot of stories but we were also linking people to certain services that they needed whether it was health whether it was legal advice whether it was uh, you know educational uh, you know people the children the kind of challenges that they were facing in terms of education in terms of access to employment so we were creating uh, we were trying to you know open little windows for dialogues i think that is what stories can do that is what films can do open windows for dialogue and the last but not the least is that um, you know which i have already talked about um, is that I i'm going to show you a film that we are we are in the post production right now this film happened after visiting the same area for almost 13 14 years anupama and i started shooting a film 5 years ago about a small village which for seven, which for about 70 years after indian independence had not got electricity and they hear they hear that the electricity was on its way and the village starts waiting for electricity and that might be a story that might resonate with my friends in africa so i would like you to see the trailer of the film and um, you know and then possibly we can open it up for discussion after that so here it goes i will play the trailer of the film and have a look Uh, 
But unfortunately, we might have to just cut it there in the interest of time. I know it is a trailer. But sure. if you can share in our chat section where we can get uh, the rest of the trailer, then we'll watch it in our own time. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, giving me the opportunity to talk. So, yeah, I'm done. Fantastic. Thank you so much to all our speakers. I mean, time truly does fly. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing all your fantastic work. Uh, and Aban, you mentioned you wanted to do some collaborations with some African artists. I saw Muti saying, you know, come to Malawi, let's work together. And I'm sure Kumba would also be very interested, which is all about song, as you heard in her presentation. She says, thumbs up. She's more than happy to collaborate with you. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. I had the time of my life today. I've had the time of my life, and I know that Pilani Bubu is on standby for the last performance. If you do want to enjoy her in full view, please make sure that you click on the three buttons on the frame of, of Pilani's um, Zoom, and then you'll be able to see her fully. This has been a fantastic session, and I guess we'll see you again next week for another session. <laughs>